Good afternoon, student. I welcome to our presentation for English Module 2. I um, guess it's Petrina Wanga, your tutor. My cell phone number is 08125 uh, This presentation is more on uh, uh, the coming uh, examination and also the content of the subject, the crucial topics that you need to know in this module. Uh, there are three prescribed books that you need to have for this model. The first one is written by Lat uh, Latrin and uh, Pincus. It's written in 2010. It's an English handbook and a study guide. Uh, you need to have this one. It's more on uh, grammar and uh, literature part. So the question that we meet uh, about the literature part or grammar part, of course, the guide, the more information are in this book. There's also a study guide which is a, a, a product of I, IOL. Uh, you also need to have this one. This one is a, a package of your registration. You get it from the office the day, same day that you register. There's also Thompson's and uh, Thompson's, which is written in 2001. It's a teaching primary English. This one is more on teaching methods, on how to use teaching aids and so forth. Okay, uh, make sure that you have these materials uh, for your preparation, either on the completion of your assignment or studying for your examination. We start with our content. This one is a summarized. I, sum I try to find some more crucial points in our guide or in our syllabus. And these are the points that I'm going to present today. You need to know, understand these topics and be able to, um, to, uh, to uh, explain, be able to explain them. Summarize study guide and points to master. Different uh, figures of speech, different figures of speech. Uh, this is the literature part where we have uh, what we call figure of speech. And this type of figure of speech are like metaphor, simile, and so forth. What is a metaphor? Let's look at this. A metaphor is the figure of speech in which an implied comparison is made between the two unlike things that are actually have the same something important in common. An example, Sam is a Jacob. This one is a figure of speech. It compare a, a, a like in the, in the example that we have, it compare a person with an animal. So means if we look at the character of Jacobs, we know Jacobs are so clever animals and so forth. So means the same is also having uh, the, the, the way Sam behaves is associated with the character of a Jekyll. That's why, that's why they say Sam is a Jekyll. And that one, a, a comparison of um, completely different things, but they have some important uh, uh, a, a common character. These are what we call that they are metaphor. Your study guide that I mentioned earlier, the first one, Latin and Pinicus, have make it easier for you to understand this type of topic. A lot of people find it difficult to understand this literature part, but if you read it very well, so there's nothing difficult in here. Simile. A simile is a type of a metaphor, but it, uh, it is distinguished from a, a common metaphor because of the use of words like words like or s. So means uh, simile is almost, uh, one can say it's a metaphor, but there are some words that make it different from a metaphor. That this one is not uh, uh, straight com uh, compare these two common, uh, two different things. But instead they use two words, which is like or s. Let's look at this example. He is fast as a cheetah. Can you see? That word S make this sentence to be a simile, but not a metaphor. But if we say he is a cheater, 
then that one is a metaphor. But if we say he is fast as a cheetah or he is fast like a cheetah, so those two comparison words make it a simile. Make sure that you know the difference between the two, the metaphor and uh, the simile. There is also neurogism. Neurogism are newly coined terms, words or phrases that might be commonly used in everyday life but have not yet been formally accepted. There are words that we use in our everyday communication, that we use in our everyday conversations, but they are not formally accepted. There are so many, and here I have examples like Google's. The Google, or Facebook, and all those type of words, they are common words, but uh, if you try to maybe to find them somewhere, even in dictionaries, you might not find them. Those are what we call the uh, neurogism. Plot. Plot is a series of arrangement of incidents, idea, or event. Um, one can say a plot. A plot is a part of uh, it's a, a, a component of literature, whereby the events are now listed in their order, different events in a story or in a drama, that they are listed now in their order, and also solutions is given on how they were overcome. Those type of, that type of arrangement, that type of flow, is what we call that it's a plot. There is also another term which is a setting. This one I did not put up the explanation with the purpose. Um, that I want you to find this, the meaning of the term setting. Okay, but I will say it for you here that setting it's a place or environment where the, the story is played or a drama. For example, let me say might be a story is talking about the children who are very naughty. Um, they go and play in the bush and uh, they do not even scared uh, of the wild animals that are in those bush. So one can tell already that this story, the setting of this story, they, if they have mentioned about wild animals, they have mentioned about bushes and so forth, they, this story, is, it's not happened in town. We do not have wild animals in town. Bushes, we don't have bushes in town. So one can already conclude either at the farm or at the village. In most cases, settings are not given in our stories. But from the reading of the content of the story, then we can be able to identify or find out the setting. Okay, you must also understand that one, the setting, you must know the setting and be able to uh, identify the setting from a certain story. There are benefits of liter literature part. Um, as I said, Latin and Pinicus has more content on uh, literature, uh, on the literature part, the features and so forth. And also if we reflect uh, back to our classrooms, our syllabus, uh, new syllabus that started um, uh, last year, mm -hmm, 2016, it has a literature part where you are asked to teach a literature part, either poem, stories, short stories and so forth. These type of things have a benefit to our learners. And what are those benefits if we have the literature in our schools? Number one, it builds experience. When learners are reading now stories from other villages, other countries and so forth, they are learning, they are getting experience what are other people are doing on the other side. And again, develop learners' thinking skills. Uh, especially the drama. Dra in drama, there are always um, a, a lot of uh, issues that uh, stimulate the thinking skills of uh, learners or children. They always, always have questions on why A, B, C happened. And these are the type of things that we need in our learners. We need this critical thinking skill in our learners. And uh, it's uh, uh, recognized that literature in language is one of the... Uh, 
highest stimulator of thinking skill in learners. It helps children to deal with problems. Uh, in stories, we find different problems presented and uh, the solution to those problems. For example, let me say, maybe if the story is talking about a man who went very far in the bush, he got lost, it got dark, and he couldn't find his way back home. Uh, because it was very dark and it was dangerous to be in the forest, he went to a nearby house, he asked for an accommodation, and he slept there. So if you, now in this story, we now seen a, a problem which was presented, a man who was lost. And again, at the same time, we were presented with, the, with a solution that the man went to a nearby house and he asked for an accommodation. From there, the learners are learning that, oh, in case I'm in a certain problem, I cannot just be there sitting and wait for the help to come to me, but I should go and look for help from a nearby uh, person or a nearby environment. Or maybe if I go into a, a forest also and then I got lost, I couldn't just be there and sleep there but I should go and ask help from the people that are around me. Okay, that is the benefit that we are getting from literature. Okay, there are also ways of developing love of read, uh, reading in our learners. This is a reading culture. And what are those ways? There are so many, many ways of uh, stimulating a reading culture in our learners. And the guide has some points. And I always emphasize this, that the guide, as it says, is just there to guide you on what exactly is happening in the subject, but not necessarily that you have to go and copy the points that are in the guide. And uh, that is what you have now to present in your assignment or in your examination, memorize, road learning. No, we are no longer doing those uh, things. What you should do is read and understand and be able to put it in your own words, in your own experience. The reading culture, how do you do it in your class? How do you motivate your learners to read? These are the points that I want. How do you make your learners to like reading? Okay, we have some points here that I have here, like provide stimulating reading materials. If you give learners materials that are so stimulating, stories uh, that are very nice, that are rousing the emotions of the learners, of course, learners who like to read because they want to hear more, they want to learn more, they want to enjoy the story and so forth. Encourage learners to bring reading books to school. That is also the best way. Read aloud to your learners. These are some of the points that we have. But try to come up even with two pages. I know you have a lot of points. That uh, reading culture, how can we instill it in our learners as teachers? Uh, communicative language teaching. Communicative language teaching is an approach to be to the teaching of second language that emphasize the interaction as both the means and ultimate goal of learning a language. It is a holistic approach. It does not focus only on traditional structure syllabus. It, makes it, it takes into consideration communicative dimensions of language. It provides vitals and motiva uh, motivation within the classroom. CRT, which stands for Communicative Language Teaching, is a learner-centered approach and it capitalizes on the interests and needs of the learners. Uh, in most cases, communicative language, people confuse it with learner-centered approach. They are not, of course, they are not very far from each other, but uh, communicative language, it's more on interacting with the learners. Of course, it's a learner-centered approach, but if you go in a class where the teacher is teaching language using communicative language, you will see the way the learners in the class are interacting. No uh, traditional method. They are learning things from context form. Are you getting my point? Understand this communicative language is the system that we are using now in our classes to teach. It's part and parcel of learner-centered education. You will find learners in groups discussing, sharing ideas, debating. Those are methods of teaching using communicative language teaching. Uh, 
Uh, I found, uh, I just realized a lot of students has a challenge on this one. I gave you this explanation, but in case it's not clear to you, uh, I can provide you more. You can call me and then I will explain more or, on this one. Now, the other part, which is also uh, a teaching strategy or technique of language, it's cartoon. Cartoon is a humorous drawing of situation. A cartoon is just a picture. It can be a funny picture or anything. How can we use this one now in our classes? It's defined how they, you must know what a cartoon is. You must understand how to define it. And you must also understand, I mean, be uh, able to tell how can you use a cartoon in your class. You can come with a, 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 a cartoon in your class and ask learners to create story based on that cartoon. Or you can uh, ask your learners to maybe to, to look at it and uh, find more words on that one day they do it as spelling test and so forth so anything that you can do with it okay that one is a teaching technique that you can use but uh, far most what we have to master is be able to understand and know what the cartoon is now on the grammar part as i said the latrine and pinnacles is the best book that you can consider when it comes to grammar and literature in grammar part we have a lot of uh, grammar part uh, uh, like um, verbs, adverbs, and so forth. But here I want only to touch on the verbs. But does not say that these are the only, or this is the only part that you have to go and study or go and read. You must read all the parts of speech that are in your guide, plus the verb then. A verb is a word used to describe an action or state or occurrence and forming the main part of the pred uh, predicate of a sentence. An example, let's run to the corner and back. Are you seeing that? Run is an action word. It's what the speaker is what uh, is an action, the act that the, the speaker is doing. So that doing word, it's a verb. I hear the train coming. Here it's a doing word. So that is a verb. Understand that one also? Okay, the, we approach the last part of our presentation where we have our homework. This one, I only want you to go and search more. The reason I give homework, I don't want to spin food, uh, spoon food you, but spin a video, I want you to go and do a research. And then the moment you do a research, then you can be able to uh, discover a lot of information and understand the topic better. Write any five sentence in a direct speech and the same five sentence change them into indirect speech. So means here you must also go and learn about direct speech and indirect speech. These are also part of grammar. Rathrin and Pincus have some examples but make sure that you understand how to change a, a certain sentence from a direct speech to indirect speech or from indirect speech to direct speech. With that, students, it's the end of our presentation. Have a great day.